say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hail at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight o'er the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there oh say does that star spangle be seated. Uh, wasn't that terrific? And welcome all, one and all. Thank you, Michelle Perry, so much. Uh, welcome to our Law Day celebration. Welcome on behalf of my colleagues seated right before me, Judges uh, Separic, Graffio, Reed, Smith, Piggott, and Jones. Welcome to our Law Day celebration, 2008, when we say this is really cool, we mean it, don't we? I'm so pleased to greet our co-host, Attorney General Andrew Cuomo, as well as State Bar President Catherine Madigan, State Bar President-elect Bernice Lieber, our extraordinary, outstanding judges of the unified court system, starting with Presiding Justice of the First Department, Jonathan Lippmann, Second Department, A. Gail Prudenti, Third Department, Anthony V. Cardona. I guess I'd have to add Judge Piggott in his former role to fill out the geography, right? Fourth Department, and all, all the great judges here today. Mayor Jennings, we're so pleased you're here. All the, the deputies and, uh, of the unified court system, our chief administrative judge, um, Ann Fow. And we so much thank Michelle Perry and the Bethlehem Central High School Senior Brass Quintet. They were great. And their conductor, Louise Schwartz, thank you so much for getting our program off to such a rousing start. Now, presiding over our Law Day ceremonies for me has been one of my favorite chief judgely responsibilities, and for so many reasons, some of them happy, and some of them distinctly not happy, this law day is different. On the bright side, it's just 50 years, precisely 50 years, since law day was proclaimed as a day of national dedication to the principle of government under law. But quite frankly, this golden anniversary Law Day celebration for the New York State Judiciary is decidedly dimmer, less lustrous, and I do not think I need to state all of my reasons for saying this. Each year, the American Bar Association chooses the theme that unites Law Day celebrations all across America. Now, this year's theme that was designated by the Bar Association is the rule of law, foundation for communities of opportunity and equity. What a mouthful, don't you agree? In fact, I puzzled for a long time to understand exactly what those words mean to convey, and I ultimately concluded that they are thematic in a couple of ways. 
First and foremost, of course, we know that Law Day celebrates the pivotal role of the rule of law in society. We are a nation that is governed by law, not by the will of particular individuals. Indeed, celebrating the rule of law was the very inspiration for Law Day back in 1958. And in that, we took our cue from the Soviet Union, which traditionally on May Day celebrated that former nation's unifying principle, which was military might. Law Day began as our nation's counterpoint. America's recognition of our unifying principle, a system of government under the force of law instead of the law of force. The rule of law is the foundation, the underpinning of this great nation of freedom and opportunity and fairness and equality. The rule of law is rooted in our constitutions, the rights and values they define, and the government they establish to implement and safeguard them, beginning with three separate and co-equal branches of government that check and balance one another. But as we know so well, without the protection of a vigilant bar and a strong and effective and independent judiciary, even the most eloquently phrased constitutional principles are no more than paper promises. It is lawyers and it is courts that give enduring reality to our nation's fundamental ideals. On this Law Day in particular, this golden anniversary, we salute the outstanding judiciary of the state of New York, which has earned and fully deserves the respect of our partners in government and the public we serve. And we thank the Bar especially for its wholehearted support in the regrettable confrontation that is so distressing to the judiciary today. Each year, in millions, millions of cases of every imaginable variety, more cases every single year, our judiciary, our courts, hold the government to its promises. We protect individuals from official overreaching. We clarify the responsibilities of one branch of government to another. We peaceably adjudicate disputes between citizens and we protect both the rights of the state and the rights of defendants in criminal matters. So yes, we surely do see and we celebrate the rule of law as the foundation of our society, a society that through the rule of law gives everyday life to our nation's promise of opportunity and equity, equality, fairness, equal justice for all. But even 50 years ago, even 50 years ago, celebration of our democracy under the rule of law was only one of the goals of the Law Day celebration. The additional idea was that organizing and presenting Law Day programs all across the nation would stimulate public awareness and foster public appreciation of our cherished democratic values and the guardians of them. For however strong they may be, foundations alone are never the end. Foundations are the beginning. Foundations are for building on. And that brings me to the wonderful young man who is seated at my side, Elijah Fagan Solis, a student at Hudson Valley Community College, winner of the David A. Garfinkel Essay Prize. The David A. Garfinkel Essay Prize was established by Gloria and Barry Garfinkel, and I'm so pleased that they are both here today, established by the Garfinkels through the Historical Society of the Courts of the State of New York to honor the memory of another remarkable young man, their son David. I am so pleased, Elijah, now to call upon you and present this prize to you. Congratulations to Elijah, 
Uh, his mother and father and brothers and sister are here today. His, uh, congratulations to Elijah's family. And congratulations as well to State Bar Association winners, Masawar and Michael, who will be introduced by Kate Madigan. They are law-related service volunteers. Again, great models for their peers to follow. Uh, and you'll see in your materials uh, Elijah's essay. It's included in the folder, and I urge you uh, to take a look at it because this is an example, it's Exhibit A, uh, of how the, the people who come after the great defenders of our nation will protect the rule of law far into the future. You'll see in your materials, you'll see Elijah's essay, he's done an absolutely terrific job of documenting his proposition that New York State throughout history has been a leader in the protection of human rights, and he's focused on the Lemon Slave case, which was decided by the Court of Appeals in the year 1860, very soon after its founding. And his essay continues with present-day court decisions that preserve and protect our cherished freedoms. So we honor Elijah, we honor Masawar and Michael, who will be introduced by Kate. They are law-related service volunteers, another great model for their peers to follow, people who give us confidence that the rule of law is secure in our nation because those who follow us will continue to learn, they will continue to understand, they will continue to value the importance of the rule of law. And special congratulations to John Zoll and Ruth Maxwell who assisted Masawar and Michael in their service project. I think it's great that Ruth, my friend Ruth Maxwell, head of the Queen's Youth Alternative, has every single year brought her students to the Court of Appeals to learn about the courts, and they learn from Ruth very, very well. And somewhat relatedly, the Court of Appeals just weeks ago itself made a memorable trip. We went to the Bronx for an afternoon of arguments in the new Hall of Justice. That was, according to the New York Times, the hottest ticket in town. And we made a stop at an extraordinary school, the High School for Law, Government, and Justice. Now that high school was deliberately placed right across the street from the courthouse, affording lots of opportunity for marvelous, positive mentoring and internship uh, opportunities. We encourage all of you as well to use our youth website, My Courts New York, and I know it's been very widely used by Ruth and her students. So as we wring our hands in despair over endangered youth and juvenile delinquency and a massive prison populations, many young families torn asunder, isn't this, isn't this, aren't these examples exactly how we want to relate to the citizenry of all ages? We want to inform, we want to instruct and educate and mentor and promote appreciation of the rule of law. We want to foster generations of knowledgeable and law-respecting and law-abiding citizens who understand the relevance of the rule of law to their daily lives. We are proud today to celebrate the rule of law that is so central to our democracy. But today's theme is more than just a statement of existing fact. It's also a reminder of how the rule of law affects our everyday lives. And above all, it's, re it's a reminder of our responsibility to promote public understanding of the rule of law. Citizens of all ages need to understand, appreciate, and honor the rule of law so as to preserve and strengthen it for ourselves and for generations to come. I close with reference to another very, very special guest who is here among us today, and that is Lady Justice. Lady Justice surrounds us on street banners on Eagle, Elk, Columbia, Lodge, and Pine Streets. Isn't she magnificent? There's one right just overhead but she's all around the block. Take a look. Lady Justice, 
blindfolded with scales in one hand and a sword in the other, blindfolded to indicate her utter impartiality, her accessibility equally to the powerful and to the powerless, the scales of justice symbolizing fair and balanced deliberation, and the sword reflecting the power of reason and justice, a tangible reminder of the rule of law that characterizes and distinguishes our great nation, a tangible reminder of our cherished heritage and our responsibility to secure that legacy for now and for the future. Thank you so much. And I would now like to call upon our totally fabulous Attorney General, Andrew Cuomo, for his Law Day remarks. Thank you very much. And first, Chief Judge Kaye, those were really beautiful and powerful remarks. And thank you for the kind introduction. To the Bethlehem Brass Quintet, let's give them a round of applause. Our host, Mayor Jerry Jennings, who's in, been in charge of the weather. Local government is in charge of the weather, and so far he's done a good job. We thank him for that. Elijah, who won the prize, very impressive piece of work. I have a good eye for talent. I want Elijah to know we have an opening in the Attorney General's office. My number is 212-416-8051. Age should not be a barrier or a limit. <laughs> to the Associate Judges of the Court of Appeals, State Bar President Madigan, other distinguished jurists, my counsel, Hank Greenberg, is here today. My personal judge, Leslie Leach, is here today, who I seduced off the bench with all sorts of promises at the AG's office, none of which became true. But he stayed anyway, which says something about him, Judge Leach. Distinguished members of the bench, ladies and gentlemen, it's, it's an honor to be here today. It's one of the, one of the privileges that I really look forward to and, and enjoy being on the steps of the Court of Appeals, which has such a, had such a profound influence on the course of events in this state's history, and to be with this Chief Judge, Judith Kay. Her judicial opinions are legal and literary landmarks. Her administrative reforms have made our court system more accessible to the public. She was appointed in 1993 by a gentleman named Mario Cuomo, and it was clearly one of his most far-sighted decisions as governor. In fact, it's a de decision I'm sure my mother had something to do with. As you know, today is the final law day over which Judith Kay will preside. Command of the state constitution requires Judge Kay to step down from the bench upon reaching the age of 70. I say it's high time this absurd rule be removed from the Constitution. We are considering an opinion in the Attorney General's office on the matter, and the logic would go something like this. The provision of the Constitution requiring re retirement at 70 was adopted in 1869. At the time of the adoption, the average life expectancy was 45 years old. Today, life expectancy is close to 80. So for constitutional purposes, 70 really is the new 50. And as I tell myself, because I'm 50, 50 really is the new 30. Therefore, Judith Kay really has 40 more years on the bench. Seriously, I ask you all to join with me 
in giving Judith Kay the round of applause she deserves for a magnificent job under difficult circumstances. <laughs> Judith Kay. I spent, I spent this past weekend in Colonial Williamsburg with my three girls, ages 10, 13, and 13. I am fully intent on the exercise of having them appreciate American history. Never mind that they consider the endeavor a form of child abuse. I am going to persist. I want them to know the truth about our great system and appreciate our great system and understand how it developed, the courage and the vision that our founders had when they created our democracy. Their simple but prophetic point that the people's judgment must govern and their inspired system to empower the people's judgment, implemented through an in intricate system of checks and balances. The Constitution, an arrangement brilliant in its conception and awesome in its endurance. And it can be all summed up in the four small words of today's theme, the rule of law. Those four words have brought us through a civil war, world wars, a depression, a civil rights movement, natural disasters, and have made us the greatest democracy on earth. The founders embodied their profound concept in permanent institutions that they distinguished, they celebrated, and they respected the executive, the legislative, and chief among them, the judiciary. Yet somehow today, on the 50th anniversary of Law Day, I fear many of these institutions, many view these institutions with skepticism and even disdain. There has been a degradation, a devaluation of government in the eyes of the public. It has not occurred overnight. The start of the slide can be traced to natural trauma such as the Vietnam War and man-made debacles such as Watergate. In political culture, it became accepted, if not preferred, to degrade government. By 1980, President Reagan came to power ridiculing public service. I'm from the government and I'm here to help was literally a joke. And this was not solely the province of one party. It became politically fashionable to claim that government was part of the problem and not part of the solution. I sense the disillusionment with government has reached new heights, or actually new lows. And it carries with it a grave danger. When respect for the rule of law erodes, it creates a vacuum. And the vacuum allows the personal prerogatives of our leaders to govern. Indeed, you need look no further than Washington, D.C. for evidence. In recent years, we've seen the President of the United States say he doesn't have to enforce laws passed by Congress which conflict with his own personal interpretation. We've seen Justice Department officials opine the unthinkable, that torture is legal and American citizens may not have a right to habeas corpus. And we've seen Congress itself abdicate to the President its constitutional obligation to declare war. These occurrences represent a departure from the rule of law and evidence of the diminishment of the institutions charged with its preservation. Another graphic illustration of this phenomenon is the diminishment of, and, and the diminishment of government is the salary issue of the state judiciary. That our judges have gone so long without a pay raise is symptomatic of the disrespect for public service that is now so prevalent. I have, re I have recused myself from the current pay raise litigation because my, rep my office represents every party in the case on other matters. But as a citizen, I believe the legislature must act immediately to pay our judges a salary commensurate with the awesome responsibility they bear. And that the issue has reached these levels 
shows the depth of the problem. It is the collision of two unfortunate and connected phenomena. The dysfunction of Albany meets the degradation of public service. When I was growing up, judges and elected officials were viewed much like ministers or rabbis or priests as men and women who responded to a higher calling. Politics was an honorable profession, and being a judge was the ultimate crown of legal accomplishment and public dedication. But today, let us make a pledge. Let's pledge to wage a campaign to restore the pride and honor in public service. These marvelous institutions were left in our care. They were built of granite and marble, etched and crafted to stand with dignity for the ages. Let us pledge to renew their shine and renew their glory. Lawyers have a special opportunity and responsibility to lead this campaign. It is our tradition. 25 of the 52 signers of the Declaration of Independence were lawyers. 32 out of 55 statesmen who framed the U.S. Constitution were lawyers. Many of the great firms today bear the names of great lawyer statesmen. Thomas Dewey, Wendell Wilkie, Joseph Proskauer, Charles, Charles Evans Hughes, Simon Rifkin. We must fund more scholarships and forgive the debts of those law students willing to enter public service. Law firms should reward those coming back from public service and encourage others to enter into public service. We must re-energize pro, bo pro bono programs so they truly meet their mission. And we must exhort our elected leaders to honor their mantle of leadership and to lead by example. We must show the next generation that duty and honor of public service is to leave this place a better place, and that effort is a life well lived. These problems are not unique to New York. They are nationwide. But it has always been New York's legacy to lead. And it has always been our mission to solve the nation's problems first here in New York and serve as an example. That is the legacy of our great governors like Franklin Delano Roosevelt and Rockefeller and Governor Carey and Governor Cuomo. That is the legacy of our great jurists, Cardozo and Lehman and Breitel and Fold. That is the legacy of Judith Kay. And it is a legacy that we will all pledge ourselves to fulfill. Thank you. I'd next like to call on our great State Bar President, Kate Madigan, but as she makes her way up here, Attorney General Cuomo, we thank you so much for your incisive, informative, stirring remarks, genuinely inspiring remarks, and it occurred to me that a great governor and his wife, my friend, excelled in another way, uh, and that was as parents of an absolutely superb and outstanding young, very young man, mature but young. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Kate, the lectern is yours. It is such an honor today to be in such extraordinary company and to hear the inspiring words of Judge Kay and Attorney General Cuomo. And I'm with you, Andrew. I'm feeling 30. When establishing Law Day back in 1958, President Eisenhower proclaimed that Americans should vigilantly guard the great heritage of liberty, justice, and equality under the law which our forefathers gave to us. He stated that we have a moral and a civic obligation to preserve and strengthen our great heritage. Now, 1958 was also the year that on Eisenhower's watch, the National Guard protected the Little Rock Nine at Little Rock Central High School. It was the year the U.S. Marines occupied Lebanon to preserve that country's pro-democratic government. It was also the year that the Cold War escalated with the advent of the nuclear arms race. And on that first law day, Eisenhower was keenly aware that we had to demonstrate to the world 
that we are a nation where laws, not men, are supreme. A nation where all individuals, no matter their race, class, gender, or faith, receive equal treatment under the law and equal access to the justice system. And so on this 50th Law Day, we have the opportunity, and perhaps, as Eisenhower suggested, a moral and civic obligation to reevaluate our role in ensuring that the rule of law extends to our most vulnerable citizens, our poor, our frail elderly, and our children. So I'd like to briefly take a moment to look at all these segments of our society and in ways in which we can fulfill Eisenhower's call to action. The rule of law, as Andrew noted, requires equality, access to justice for all, regardless of one's position in our society. And yet, despite the millions of hours of pro bono services provided each year to the poor by lawyers across this great state, we can only meet 20% of the need. 45 years ago, in Gideon versus Wainwright, the U.S. Supreme Court held that it was shocking to our sense of justice that we would incarcerate a criminal defendant who was tried and convicted without an attorney. And I ask you, isn't it just as shocking that we leave the poor and most vulnerable to represent themselves in the battle for basic human needs, shelter, sustenance, safety, and health care? Whether forced out of their homes, terrified by a domestic abuser, denied government benefits, without adequate representation, the poor are confined, the poor are denied due process, and the poor do indeed suffer a loss of liberty. And in many cases, this loss is just as great, and if not greater, had they been convicted of a crime and imprisoned. Isn't the loss of shelter, food, safety, or health care just as fundamental? Surely, this is not the heritage that Eisenhower envisioned. In March, we had the privilege of hosting a statewide conference with attorneys, judges, academics, political and bar leaders, and civil justice advocates in order to develop a long-term strategy, a blueprint to try to close our 80% justice gap, to create a civil Gideon or the right to counsel right here in New York. 33 states have a right to counsel to some degree, and we are not one of them. Indeed, we are one of only seven states in the entire nation who failed to provide stable funding for legal services to the poor. We all know the consequences of unmet civil legal needs. We all know that prevention is pivotal. We also know the cost benefits, that if we fail to make that essential investment, if we don't pay now for preventative legal services for the poor, to keep them in their homes, to protect them from domestic abuse, to preserve their health care or government benefits, we as a society, as taxpayers and citizens, we all pay dearly later. And when the poor are also our frail elderly, when they face eviction, are denied disability or social security benefits without the assistance of counsel, they are not only at high risk of homelessness, but that can begin a downward spiral that ends up in hospitalization and institutionalization in a nursing home, typically at public expense. And I will leave for another day the conversation about our long-term care system, our financing system, that is neither fair nor rational and which strips our, se our senior citizens of their dignity, their ability to remain in their communities, requiring impoverishment in order to qualify. Law Day is also a time to reevaluate our role in ensuring that our young people have the opportunity and the means to understand and actively participate in our democratic form of governance. A recent study by the Annenberg Public Policy Institute found that less than one in ten Americans can identify the Chief Justice of the United States, but two-thirds of Americans can name one or more of the judges on American Idol and only a little more than one-third of our Americans can name our separate three co-equal branches of government, let alone describe their role in our democratic system. Those implications are truly alarming. Here in New York, our schools play an essential role in civic education, and we know that students that receive 
high quality civic education, such as the model we have here in New York State, are two to three more times likely to vote, to be well informed about local, state, and national issues, and to engage actively with their official elected, officials, elected officials and their concerns. And as noted by Sandra Day O'Connor, retired justice of the U.S. Supreme Court and one of our nation's champions for civic education, knowledge of our Constitution and the role of the courts is not handed down in the gene pool. Each generation must learn about our system of government and the citizen's role. So it is up to us to ensure that our great heritage is passed along to future generations. The State Bar's Law, Youth, and Citizenship Program, which is the third largest law and civic education program in the nation, is now in its 32nd year of service to the students and teachers here in New York State. It's our mock trial program, We the People, Project Citizen, to name a few. Now last year, during this Law Day celebration, we launched our Youth Service Advocate Program. And this is a program that recognizes and honors young people between the ages of 10 and 18 who have provided law-related volunteer service to their community. Now the Youth Service Advocate designation is more than an honorary title. The exceptional youth who qualify as Youth Service Advocates become role models in their communities. They empower and they inspire their peers to do likewise. And today, we are most delighted to honor two participants of our new Youth Service Advocate Program. Each of these young men have devote, has devoted more than 80 hours of service to their local youth courts. They have defended and prosecuted their peers who were charged with minor criminal acts. They interviewed witnesses, prepared defenses. They also served as judges and jurors, determining guilt or innocence, with the guilty being sentenced to community service. As one of them stated in their application, and I'm going to quote, not only am I able to give back to the community, I am able to give back to myself, helping guide troubled and lost teens in the right direction gives me a warm sensation in my heart, end quote. And I'd like to congratulate Masawar Ahmed and Michael Ibramchiev so that we could recognize you as our youth service advocates. As you can see, these programs help our young people develop the knowledge, the experience, and the character that they will need to become productive, active citizens, and future leaders of our country. There is no better investment than in our young people. And in the words of Marianne Wright Edelman, our national defender of children, particularly our youth at risk, the question is not whether we can afford to invest in every child. It is whether we can afford not to. In conceiving Law Day 50 years ago, President Eisenhower proclaimed that our nation is a beacon of light for oppressed peoples throughout the world. This is our legacy. Preserving the rule of law requires us to honor that legacy both at home and abroad. We are on a world stage. We compete in an increasingly global market. And our children deserve a nation that cares for its poor and elderly, a nation that elevates its future generations by instilling in them the virtues that we celebrate each year on Law Day. Our society is indeed measured by how we care for our poor, our children, and our elderly. And the world is watching. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Kate Madigan. And I'd like to call uh, upon our Chief Administrative Judge, Ann Fow. And as she's making her way up here, I, it just occurred to me that isn't this the perfect Law Day ceremony? We have great stirring remarks by the Attorney General, our State Bar President. We have the Mayor of Albany holding the rein until the ceremony concludes. We have a citizens group on the steps of the Capitol holding a demonstration. Now, would we want it any other way? This is America. This is America. And best of all, 
We have the temperature fixed at just about 55 because we know how, how frosty this group is, how energetic and how much you like to keep just, just above the freezing level. And, and we have accommodated you. But finally, another great tradition that we honor at our Law Day ceremonies is uh, paying respect to the employees who make the unified court system so great. And it's my privilege now to introduce our chief administrative judge who will present, make special presentations to several of those people. And I want to offer my thanks to all of them. Thank you. We are so grateful that the Court of Appeals has established as part of its Law Day celebration a special tradition in which we honor members of our court family who in their daily and professional lives epitomize the very best of public service and good citizenship. Today we continue this tradition by recognizing four remarkable individuals who are making a positive difference in their courts and their communities. The first is Justin Berry, and Justin, would you come up? <laughs> Justin Berry oversees the day-to-day -day operations of a comprehensive drug court program that th serves thousands of nonviolent offenders in New York City criminal court in all five boroughs. Very few people could perform this demanding job as well as Justin does, and fewer still would go out of their way to take on the extra projects that he does. For example, Justin was instrumental in putting together the protocols that allow the criminal court to screen DWI cases as required by new legislation. And in implementing innovative commuter, com, computer scanning technology, that allows us to track arrest to arraignment processing times. He has taken it upon himself to organize the court system's annual employee recognition program and to revive the court's popular newsletter. He produces the court's annual report, sits on the Gender Fairness Committee, and serves as a tour guide for the many, many judges and dignitaries who come from all around the world to see the New York City Criminal Court in action. I could go on and on because there's so much more. And Justin does it all with genuine, heartfelt enthusiasm and grace that never fails to inspire his colleagues and his staff. So it is our great pleasure to present this year's Merit Performance Award for Superior Work Performance to Justin Berry in recognition of his energetic leadership and outstanding accomplishments. Very well deserved. Our second recipient is Cindy O'Bara. Cindy O'Bara is the champion and the driving force behind the 8th Judicial District's many outstanding public education activities, including those of its committee to promote public confidence in the court. Cindy's boundless energy and organizational talents are the reasons for the consistent success of the district's many public outreach programs, including clergy days and events aimed at schools and young people. Cindy personally invests herself in each one of these events, from designing and drafting the brochures to recruiting speakers to arranging for food, her high standards and good judgment ensure that every program is innovative and inspirational. It's also very fitting that Cindy is being publicly honored on Law Day as she is the driving force behind the district's very popular Law Day programs. So we are delighted to uh, present Cindy with this year's Merit Performance Award for Outstanding Educational Efforts in recognition of her wholehearted contribution to the important work of educating our youth and public about the judiciary. Congratulations.
Okay. Eloina Diaz. Our next honoree, senior court clerk Eloina Diaz, uses her valuable knowledge and experience to improve the lives of incapacitated people in the Richmond County Supreme Court's guardianship part. Ellie has compiled a famously comprehensive list of resources and contacts that she uses to link incapacitated people to vital services. She recently worked on a case of a young man paralyzed by a diving accident who was living in a windowless attic without hope for the future. Thanks to Ellie's efforts, that young man today resides in a studio apartment and has reclaimed his future. She helped guide him through the intricacies of the many agencies that provided him with telephone, internet services. He could obtain a high school equivalency diploma and interact with the world. Outside of the court, Ellie devotes many hours to organizations to help women in need. Ellie, for your resourcefulness and persistence in cutting through red tape to improve the lives of those in need, we take the greatest pleasure in presenting you with a 2008 Merit Performance Award for Community Service and Humanitarian Pursuits. And finally, Timothy Cowart, Jr. <laughs> On April 17, 2007, Court Officer Timothy Cowart, Jr. was on his way to work in the Bronx County Supreme Court when he looked out the open doors of his subway at the Hunts Point Station and ta saw two men arguing. The argument quickly became a fist fight and in a matter of seconds, the two men fell off of the platform onto the subway tracks. Officer Cowart didn't think twice. He jumped down onto the tracks to save the men from the deadly third rail. Officer Cowart, uh, when he got there, the two men were sprawled across the tracks, unconscious and close to the rail. Officer Cowart stood over the men to protect them from further harm until others could help him carry them to safety. More than a few people have questioned why Officer Coward would risk his personal safety to, rec to rescue those men. But his response, it was the right thing to do, tells you all you need to know about Officer Coward. It is our great privilege to present Officer Coward with this year's Merit Performance Award for Heroism in recognition of his selfless and skillful actions on that fateful day at the Hutz Point train station. Thank you so much, Judge Thau. Uh, congratulations and profound thanks to each of the Merit Performance Award winners. Uh, a special round of applause. Uh, and I'd now like to call uh, back to the microphone Michelle Perry uh, for America the Beautiful which will conclude our Law Day 2008 ceremony. Um, our wonderful brass quintet is going to go on playing for a while. Thank you. Um, and I hope you'll all linger and enjoy the warmth of one another's company. Uh, Michelle, I'm going to stay here, too. Oh, beautiful. For spacious skies, for amber waves of gray, for purple mountain majesties above the fruited plains. America, America, God.
God shed His grace on thee and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. God shed His grace on thee and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. Wow. Thank you. 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 Thank you.